Hello again. Uh, this presentation is called, for official purposes, The Perils of the Internet for Our Clients. But I think it's more aptly called something slightly different and maybe not as catchy. But The Perils and Possibilities of the Internet and Technology, Generally Speaking, for Our Clients. Because the Internet is usually the entryway into uh, the world as we know it right now and the world of the future, which is what we're going to eventually be talking about in the course of this presentation. Before I start and even move to the next slide, I just want to say that uh, warning, 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 uh, I know probably no one here would be surprised to um, learn that there's some explicit content in this uh, evaluation. I think a little more explicit than even what we've already heard of this morning. Um, uh, CLEs don't tend to talk about uh, sex robots generally, but this one will. And um, so, so there'll be some explicit content and there'll also be some, I guess, disturbing content. And I think people kind of came here um, on an applied assumption of risk theory, but I know that, um, you know, trigger warnings are a thing these days and I just want to let people know that uh, as I was working my way through the course outline here, I became disturbed uh, and maybe even depressed at moments about what's happening in the world around us and so you know I don't I don't really know what that means for you but I did want to um, to engage in full disclosure and be responsible about what's happening here so off we go <laughs> um, maybe why isn't this working Okay, so um, I'm starting out probably, this is an easy one here, with the two poster boys for internet facilitated sex crimes. And they're easy targets, that's for sure, but I think they also present pretty um, good examples of the spectrum of conduct at issue here. Um, and certainly their uh, judgment was spectacularly terrible and their um, public, they really um, came from a place of great privilege and now uh, the fall was uh, very, very hard for, for both of them, I imagine. But the, w the reason why I say that they present good examples of the spectrum of uh, offense behavior that we're talking about here is it goes from hands-on horrific accusations um, in the Jared Fogel case, him and uh, even worse when it came to his partner in crime, I can't remember what that guy's name is, but you know, they were, were, they were traveling all around the country, they were trying to find girls who were as young as 14, uh, texting, um, having sex for money with juvenile prostitutes, I mean, just the panoply of, of horribles. Um, whereas, Anthony Weiner was doing something different and arguably more common, which was just taking advantage of the fact that this is like shooting fish in a barrel. On the internet, you can find uh, kids, you can find grown-ups, you can find anyone willing to engage with you from a great distance in sexual banter and escalating levels of communication to include what ultimately winds up being uh, child pornography. So um, we, we've probably all handled cases um, of this variety and maybe some cases in between, but I think that um, it's important to understand that while uh, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble doing either one of these things, these are very different types of behaviors that we're talking about here. I'm gonna try that, there we go. Okay. So 
how do people like this find themselves in these situations? And I think it's because they don't understand uh, on some fundamental level they've deluded themselves into believing in the anonymity of the internet. And of course we know that that's entirely illusory, right? There's any number of ways, uh, any number of websites and applications that facilitate sort of your entree into this world. And I've listed some of the more common ones here, you know, Instagram, Tumblr, Backpage and Craigslist. Uh, TNA Board is an escort rating service, which just got a lot of people, services like that, just got a lot of people um, in this area in trouble within the last couple years. But, you know, there's other things, too, things that we think about um, as being, I guess, slightly more legitimate, if you could call it that, but like dating apps, right, like Tinder and Grindr, where you think, oh, I'm just going on here to do what people do in the 21st century, meet people, but you can find yourself in situations where their people are younger than they really are uh, advertising themselves to be and you can find yourself in a whole world of hurt. We had a client recently who uh, found somebody on a, a site or um, an app called Boy Ahoy and it was for, it was um, targeted towards um, young men but there were, uh, there was a kid on there who was misrepresenting himself and our client found out when it was way too late and uh, he was in a, a world of hurt with respect to that. Um, uh, Val Ritchie, who's a prosecutor here in King County, I think pointed out something that maybe is fairly obvious on its face, but this is just uh, a situation where the wheels are greased for illegal behavior. It's very easy for he says men, but I guess potentially everyone, to find themselves down the, the rabbit hole of um, criminal behavior when it comes to meeting people online. So wh from whence the, the danger, right? And um, in many places is ultimately the answer, but I think it starts out looking at uh, federal, um, federal statutory um, guidance on child pornography. And back in, in 1996, um, the uh, Congress passed the Child Pornography Prevention Act, which subsequently has been um, in large part overruled as unconstitutional incursion on First Amendment. But <clears throat> in that in that act, the intent was, I think what we all know to be the general and prevailing intent in our society today, which is to try to expand the definition of what's considered child pornography to be increasingly protective in this changing world that we're living in. So this act, um, this act outlawed images that appear to be of a minor engaging in sexually explicit conduct and ultimately it was struck down in um, Ashcroft vers versus Free Speech Coalition because um, there was a universe of First Amendment protected activity, right? Like younger actors, 19, 20 year olds who were playing the role of underage people and the court said, no, that's okay because there's no children actually being harmed in the production of this quote unquote pornography. And, um, and that would be the same for any computer generated imagery um, that looked um, virtually like a child. So then from, from there, where we went was the uh, Protect Act of 2003. Um, this act changes the language in a important way in the sense that it required um, depictions that were indistinguishable from that of a minor, um, but but not um, but not computer generated or other uh, other areas that Ashcroft um, versus Free Speech Coalition had said no, that's not okay. You can't regulate that. But interestingly, um, it doesn't actually require child pornography um, in order to be um, prohibited under the new statute because there's a pandering um, a pandering uh, part of the statute which says that if you think 
you are engaging in um, a transaction to acquire child pornography from a detective, say, for example, and there is actually no child pornography at issue, you're still going to be guilty. So it's different than the previous act that was unconstitutional in the sense that you know certain things are allowed under the First Amendment, but it still doesn't require actual child pornography to incur criminal <laughs> liability under this uh, statute. So what does criminal liability look like? Well, it's pretty significant on the federal level. Um, uh, most of you know that we're dealing with very severe uh, mandatory minimum sentences usually in this area. Of course, uh, child pornography possession is one of the few instances in which we're not talking about mandatory minimums. Otherwise, receipt, distribution, all that type of stuff is going to get you 5, 15 years um, for uh, the child pornography offenses and also the obscenity offenses. Those also follow the same federal statutes in terms of the penalties uh, for obscene material that's not child pornography. So in Washington state we have uh, a, dif a different set of child pornography statutes. Um, and child pornography like statutes. Interestingly, the most serious is uh, the most serious in terms of offense level and time is sexual exploitation, which isn't exactly a um, child pornography offense, but for all intents and purposes, um, that's the most serious um, arrow in the quiver of a state prosecutor in terms of prosecuting child pornography offenses. Um, the other most common offenses that we're dealing with in this area is communication with a minor for no purposes, with, which sometimes can overlap with child pornography, um, sexting type situations, um, and also the promoting prostitution in the first and second degrees, which again don't really seem necessarily like they would involve technology and electronics, but thanks to the creativity of the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, it turns out that using um, you know, ratings websites or whatever can turn you into basically an electronic pimp for the purposes of um, criminal liability. I'm sorry about that. Got a nice beat though. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's a nice background. Um, if it if it keeps doing that, I, I maybe I'll turn it off if people can hear me well enough. Anyway, um, and you know one of the things that's interesting about the state statutes is that we oftentimes in King County have a situation where uh, your client is threatened, right? Like plead guilty here or you're going federal, and you can look at the ranges here and you know that well that's not really a real choice. But interestingly, I was talking to Amy Barron Evans. I don't know if any of you know her. She does. Uh, she works for the Federal Defender's Office, and she pointed out in a talk that she gave yesterday the, at the courthouse that we're actually pretty lucky that we have a state sentencing, uh, a statutory scheme for child pornography, because there is an option here for uh, prosecution at the state level, which is um, ironic. I mean, it's. It's much more favorable than the, than the federal guidelines in terms of time. Um, but our, I don't think our clients usually feel lucky about that. But uh, relatively speaking, um, they, they are. Um, so, you know, what do prosecutors make of, um, of the laws that we have on the books and the harsh penalties? and then the explosion of technology and activities that people can get themselves into on the internet. You know, it's really, um, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, Val Ritchie and other prosecutors, you know, point out that the internet makes um, offense behavior very easy for people, but by the same token, it kind of makes prosecutors pretty easy for the prosecutors because they're taking old laws that are very harsh because they were intended to punish uh, behavior that was imagined at that time as being the worst of the worst kind of behavior and actually kind of difficult to engage in. And then they're using it now in situations that are very easy to kind of blunder into, right? Um, 
situations like kids texting each other images of themselves. And they're saying, okay, well, then you can go to prison for 15 years. You know, I don't think that that's what Jesse Helms, his wildest, you know, smut peddling um, fantasies was thinking about back in the 90, the early 90s when he was advocating for ratcheting up the federal mandatory minimums on child pornography. You know, he wasn't imagining a 19-year-old kid sitting in their house in Wisconsin, you know, begging enticing, wheedling a 14-year-old girl in Washington State for an image of herself. You know, that is a very different behavior than plucking small children out of their situation and forcing them into some type of terrible, you know, child porno pornography production studio. Those, of that, those behaviors are so different, yet we're saying, oh, that's the same punishment for this crime, 15 years. Um, other novel uh, approaches prosecutors have taken, um, it, and, and the discretion is all with them, right? They get to control the game because they're controlling the charging document. Um, I alluded to a few minutes ago, the first in the country uh, prosecutions for promoting prostitution in the second degree that we had here pursuant to um, some uh, escort rating websites called the Review Board or K-Girl Delights. Um, where a bunch of um, men would get on and say, you know, admittedly pretty gross things about these women, but, um, but they would have, in the normal course of things, just been charged with patronizing um, a, a simple misdemeanor, but instead, uh, the pros Dan Satterberg decided, nope, we're going to make examples of these guys, and, you know, they could potentially be going to prison. Never mind all the other very um, serious collateral consequences that result from promoting prostitution charges as opposed to a simple misdemeanor patronizing charge. But I thought it was interesting that um, uh, Sheriff Urquhart said in the, um, in the very beginning of one of those things that they were running with these review board sites, he said, um, yeah, okay, well, we're just going to get these guys for patronizing. I mean, I, gr I realize it's just a simple misdemeanor, but, you know, we have your names. And in the meantime, there were already 14 guys in jail being held on promoting charges. So I'm not sure if he and Dan Satterberg didn't talk or what happened um, why he was still operating in the universe that we all sort of had come to expect, but that the prosecuting attorney offered saying, no, we're going to really make examples of these guys. So that was one, you know, sort of thing that struck me in terms of, well, we are actually in a very different environment now than we have been um, with respect to dangers and perils that are out there for, for our clients. The other one, of course, is the infamous case of State Gray that made national news when the prosecutors decided um, to charge a 17-year-old with sending an explicit photo of himself um, and then charging him with a pornography offense. Um, I was talking to somebody at the lake that there is a bill in the state, uh, the uh, Senate Bill 56, 50, 65, 66, that is hopefully going to be a statutory fix for that problem. I think it's, has it passed in the Senate? It passed in the Senate, it's in committee in the House right now. Okay. So I don't know. Okay, and the Seattle Times over the weekend was calling for the passage of that bill. I think what it does is it makes, um, that that sexting behavior on um, in the juvenile context to a misdemeanor um, from from the felony charge that uh, Gray was convicted of. Okay, now this is the the exciting part. James is going to tell you a little bit about where we're going. We cut the video, right? We cut the video. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is what you guys all came for today, <laughs> was to hear about what wild things are happening in the world of human sexuality today and what you can look forward to uh, in the coming years. <clears throat> I want to break this, this section down into three parts. Virtual reality, haptic technology, <laughs> and sex robots. Um, they're all real. They're all going to be a part of our society. They're all evolving rapidly right now. 
starting with virtual reality, let's just think about it in its, its um, most basic form to begin with. Just a, a virtual reality is a platform to view pornographic cinema. Imagine how powerful that is for somebody compared to just watching it on a flat screen. You put your virtual reality goggles on and all of a sudden, instead of looking at a screen, you're on the set. You're in the room, you're looking around like, oh my gosh, what are they doing over here? Well, wow. And in, 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 in some of the ways it's, it's filmed, you look down and whoa, whoa, somebody's doing something to me, right? It's, you're in the scene. You're there in three dimension. If you're looking for something to be highly stimulating, regular pornography does not, co does not compare to that. Taking that a step further, you could take the same technology and have virtual worlds in which to interact with other people. So now you have the, 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 the helmet on, maybe you have accelerometers on it. Everybody know what an accelerometer is? It detects movement so you can see where, where, what's going, right? And you can interact with other people and maybe there are avatars in there. And so you're interacting with people in another world. And perhaps interacting sexually with them. We're gonna take it a step further. But before we do, let me talk about haptic technology. So has anybody heard of haptic technology, what that is? Has anybody um, uh, played uh, like, like car racing games with a force feedback steering wheel? The idea is like, it, you know, you're pushing, you're going into a turn, it kind of pushes back, right? And so it feels real like you're driving a real car. That's one of the first uh, widespread uses of uh, haptic technology for entertainment purposes. So that is, that is an example of haptic technology in the form of force feedback. But there's other haptic technologies. There's thermal uh, technology so that you feel warmth. There's, there's electroconductive that gives the sensation of touch. So there's actually a haptic suit out there uh, that, that people can wear and it has uh, electric pads all over it down the arms and the legs and when when uh, pieces of it are activated you feel like somebody's running their hand down your back for example uh, pretty intense to think about and the, the the sensors and the stimulators and these things are going to get smaller and more numerous so instead of having a general sensation here you're going to feel like fingernails going you know eventually right we just have to keep advancing the technology this this whole conversation about haptic technology certainly is not without it, it's a, attention to the genital region as well and there's a variety of ways in which this is, has, has evolved already and will continue to evolve there's a, 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 a haptic joystick out there that it was designed for for um, shooting games, right? You, sh you hold it and it and you can move it around in three dimension, unlike a normal joystick, which is just you know like that. You move it three dimensional and and interact with the shooter game. So what they did is they modified it so that there's a joystick on one one end and on the other end is a receiver that that replicates the movement, kind of like the digipin, right? Everybody knows what the digipin is, right? Now we stick a dildo on the end of that and somebody can operate that from across the world. <laughs> okay. Similarly for, for men's pleasure, there are devices that you know operate like a vagina or an anus that, that can stimulate them. Same principles of it being moved electronically from a, from a distance. If we combine all of that with virtual reality, now think about what you got. If, 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 if we take that suit further, and we take the general simulation, and we take the VR goggles, and more, and the, and the thermal sensors, and all of that, at some point in time, you're 
having sex with somebody on the other side of the world through this virtual environment. And they can choose to look like anything because they're in a virtual world, right? And think about how far the computer graphics have gone, right? And how lifelike somebody could look in a virtual world as this progresses. And they can choose to look like whatever they want to look like and interact with you and have sex with you. Sex robots. I wanted to say, talk about that before I talk about sex robots because I actually think that they're competing technologies, if you think about it. Because sex robot, if you stay here in the real world and you, use you bring technology into the real world to create a fantasy experience. Whereas with what I just described a moment ago, you're stepping into a virtual world to have a fantasy experience. You're accomplishing the same thing theoretically, but using totally different strategies. Does that make sense? So sex robots are real. Um, I personally think that the, um, the media has exaggerated how, far, how well advanced they are at this point in time. The media, the, the, this last year, the media went crazy over sex robots. And there are articles all over the place. The, the sex robots are here. The invasion of the sex bots, right? Um, and then, you know, a couple of years before, it was VR goggles and VR porn, you know, all that. <coughs> sex robots are real, and they are going to continue to advance. <coughs> but the think think about what it takes for a sex robot to be really, really um, effective, and what they're trying to make it. You need to be able to talk to it or interact with it in some way and have it not like look like, you know, some, you know, really cheap droid that like moves in like, you know, you know, fidgety ways. That's not going to be, most people aren't going to be as, as, as turned on by that versus, I think the example I gave yesterday was uh, Data from Star Trek, right? Data was a robot that looked like a normal person. Right, when we get to that or anywhere close to that, then we're going to be have something that's going to be really, really powerful. And data was fully functioning. And data was fully functioning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which actually comes up com comes to the thing uh, long and I don't, I don't want to go too far ahead of the conversation of uh, if we get to a point where we have artificial intelligence in sex robots, there are there are law professors out there talking about when do they get rights. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but 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 this this is real. The, the sex robots are, are out there, they're being there's a lot of money going into them. Five years ago, instead of sex robots, what we had was um, I think the best example was the real doll. Which was it was you know, people say you talk about blow up dolls, right? Well this is a a, a actual silicon Doll, full body size that's solid instead of filled with air. That's as, as lifelike as they can make it. Where the, the 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 breast tissue, for example, would be much closer to you know what a female breast would really feel like versus just feeling like a balloon, right? And but but that's again to my my point. It's not as convincing as the data model, right? That's just a piece of rubber. So I personally believe that when I compare these two different tracks, the virtual track with haptic technology versus the sex robots, I think at some point in time the sex robots will become much more commonplace and much more convincing. In the short run, I think the virtual reality world wins. I think that's in the next three years, I think you see more and more virtual reality stuff taking off and the, the types of sexual experiences that you can experience in the virtual world just really, really escalate. Sex robots will be on the market and they will continue to involve. They'll be there. They'll be an ongoing conversation at the same time. But in addition to the convincingness of the sex robot, the other thing you have is price. So I don't know what, what, what people are going to be charging for these things. But I look at what, what it costs and you know, I follow technology enough to have a 
a general idea that we're talking about the tens of thousands of dollars, not the hundreds of dollars. These things are going to be very expensive, at least for a long time. Whereas a, a, a VR headset you can purchase um, at, at Fry's for $50. Uh, all right. And if you're doing it with some kids, that's not child pornography. Wait, wait for it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, there are a variety of other instances of haptic technology beyond what I, I, I said. So, for example, there are sex toys that couples that are marketed to couples today, where somebody can um, control it from far away. That are designed not necessarily to be used in, with a you know in a virtual environment in the way I, the way I described, but more to aid uh, people having uh, sexual contact when they're separated by distance. This could be a married couple, for example, right? Where where there's a vibrator that she can use that he's controlling from Beijing. And, and, and a variety of other toys like this. So I just want to make you aware that 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 that, that there is a um, some diversity into the directions in which this is going. So of course, there's a dark side to the technology, which you probably all knew where we were going here. Um, so there's there's increasing discussion of criminal liability resulting from this type of activity, and. Um, I think this is probably, silver lining wise, job security for all of us because, I mean, I don't play these kind of video games, but I understand that they are quite realistic and that there might be a lot of misogyny in this community of people who are engaged in these uh, multi massive player games or whatever they're called. Um, but there, the, this particular article, which is linked in the electronic version of the presentation, talks about a woman who was playing one of those games and who was sexually assaulted. Uh, her avatar was sexually assaulted. And, and um, that is probably going to be a scenario that repeats itself um, on and on and geometrically increasing proportions as we go forward. And there are certainly people out there. Um, I think in Europe they're a little bit uh, ahead of the game in terms of thinking and uh, writing about criminalizing virtual sexual assault. And there's definitions that have been uh, bandied about, and I put one up here on the on the slide for you. But I think that the question is, you know, are we going to decide that that's a good idea to criminalize this? And if we are, how are we going to do it? Are we going to kind of go Dan Satterberg style and and shoehorn um, some laws that we have on the books into a novel charging situation, or are we going to create new categories of law? that punish virtual sexual assault um, in a, a situation um, like a video game or something else that I can't even conceive of at this very moment. Um, so people are, people are already articulating rationales for doing this. Um, I, I'm not taking a position whether or not that's a, a good or bad idea, certainly, um, but just that it's coming down the pike. Um, and this is the part where things go um, really haywire, I think, um, and to the question that was sort of brought up earlier, right, which is when you have a, a child, right, whether it's virtually or a, a robot, you know, is that, wh what are we going to do with that? And um, there, as James said, sex robots exist. Um, people are producing them. I think the most famous one is called Harmony. And I did read articles about men who think they are in relationships with these robots. But anyway, uh, people are, are producing these child sex <laughs> robots. Um, I think Japan is probably the most um, well-known example. This fellow who's quoted about, who's talked about in this slide, I guess is a fairly well-known um, and maybe self-professed pedophile. Um, and he's involved in a company that um, makes child sex dolls according to particular specifications of the client. Um, and again, this situation of child sex robots 
Um, if we are looking to punish them, we're going to need a theory of liability. My understanding is that there are certain countries that they're already illegal in, I think the UK, Australia, and one other country. Um, there is a act in the Congress here in the United States, uh, which is called um, the Creeper Act of 2017. They had to stretch, I know, to be able to find uh, the way to support that acronym. The Creeper Act stands for Curbing Realistic Exploitative Electronic Pedophilic Robots. Um, it's been introduced in the House, and what it does is not um, prohibit possessing a child sex robot per se, but the importation of such becomes a federal crime. Um, these two doctors who work at John Jay College of Criminology in New York are very active in um, uh, proposing novel theories of criminalization going forward. There's a, this article, not this article, this is a news article, but the one on the previous slide, which is more of a law review article, actually was quite interesting because they analyzed child sex robots under both child pornography um, law standards and also obscenity standards. And they sort of, um, I think, illogically and inexplicably <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless conclude that um, that child sex robots actually should be considered child pornography and obscene and therefore punishable under either one of those statutes. They're not lawyers, so I don't think this is going to happen any minute now, but based on the trajectory of where we're going, right, we're getting really nervous about this kind of stuff, so we're being over-inclusive in terms of definitions statutory-wise at the federal level, certainly, and also uh, increasing mandatory minimums, or at least having harsh mandatory minimums uh, on the books, then, um, then there's a real danger that we're going to be coming closer and closer to this reality as we move forward. Um, the, the, oh, did you have a question? I was just thinking that if you're, one reason to criminalize it is that you're having pedophiles just like continue I mean, to get habituated to having that kind of interaction. I mean, it's, so that is kind of a problem. I mean, we, for the sake of those individuals. You know. Exactly. And I think that that's one of the rationales behind uh, the criminalization of just possessing a, a, a child sex robot. But, you know, there's also therapeutic, I think, ideas that this is a preventative strategy. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how reputable that Japanese fellow is, but I know that's one of the rationales that he uses. Is oh, if, yeah, <laughs> and, and others, I think probably in the treatment community, um, who, who say, you know, well, maybe we can limit it to the robots and we're actually going to pr uh, protect children out there because people are going to be happy in their relationships with their child sex robots. You know, I don't know. But um, adults seem to be somewhat happy with their adult sex robots. So, um, you know, I think it's a, a huge new frontier for us to contemplate going forward. Um, but the, the next step, and, you know, I think the most, uh, taking it to an even more troubling level, is this notion of robotic rape and robotic child rape. And there are people out there that, um, that are, are thinking, proposing, writing that um, we should be criminalizing, you know, interactions with robots. <laughs> and James talked about a different theory of liability um, that might be that we might all be grappling with in the future, which is do these things have rights? And I'm I didn't go there, but um, the fact of the matter is you can program. Um, these artificially intelligent robots to have particular profiles. Like one that I have heard about is um, Frigid Fera is an option for a sex robot, right? You can ask for that profile to be installed in your doll and she is programmed to reject every advance you make to her, thereby encouraging people to act out their rape fantasies. And so um, because of situations like that, I think people are saying, um, you know, 
we need to think about sexual assault, not just the possession of this thing that is potentially problematic in and of itself, but what behaviors are people engaged in. And how we would come to know about those behaviors, um, you know, I don't know, but we are coming, we know about a lot of things that we probably didn't think we would ever be privy to because of the electronic nature of communications and how things are saved and perpetuated uh, for all eternity on cloud servers ev everywhere. Um, so James, I think you were going to talk about, is there an upside <laughs> to this whole uh, grim world we're, we're living in? So briefly to, to add to the, the downside, <laughs> um, the, the ability for people to create a experience that they, they, they wouldn't normally have in, in real life and to be able to engineer that um, certainly raises very serious questions about what it does to shape that person's sexuality. The reality is, is that our sexualities do change over time. The things we do, do does shift what, what turns us on, what turns us off, and how we respond. And so I would expect that, as with everything, that this, this type of technology can shift people in, in ways that they don't even understand on the front end. And it can create expectations that then when transitioning to the real world with real people, could cause real harm. So on one hand, you could say, well, the rape fantasy, maybe we get that out with the sex robot and, 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 and you know, John always does that with the sex robot or, or, or with the child sex robot or whatever. On the other hand, this has been reinforced over and over again now for John. And, and what he expects intuitively when he, when he engages in a sexual exercise has changed and his reflexes will be different and, and and so that's where I have a lot of concern on the upside though what can we what can we do positive with this uh, well I do think there's a lot of, of really great possibilities um, for, for one a lot of uh, individuals who are in a relationship um, they do have barriers to physical intimacy by distance and, and, and other means. And I think that the, the technology can go a long way in actually helping people to connect. Right? And that's a good thing. We should feel good about that. Um, some of this technology could also um, be used for people who have certain types of sexual disorders. So many people within the sex therapy realm advocate for the use of surrogates. It's a very controversial subject. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> what that was. Many people uh, advocate, advocate for the use of surrogates. We're not going to get into that debate, but the point of, of, of sexual surrogates is that people who have difficulties with sexuality have somebody that they can, a way to, to be able to work through that, right? Well, maybe a sex robot could fulfill that role instead or maybe certain uses of virtual technology could do that instead. Another thing that's been proposed is, so you talked about Frigid Farah, think about the flip side of it. What if you, what if you program some of this technology that you didn't get anything unless you were respectful and, and, and treated somebody with mutual pleasure and dignity, right? That theoretically could help people to be more egalitarian in how they approach sexuality. Um, regardless of the, the good and the bad, it's going to happen, right? And so I think that in terms of both the law and in terms of health, we need to be thinking about it as a society now to decide where do we want it to go. The technology will be here. It's already on the front end of the wave. What will we do with it? Any questions?
<laughs> Anybody going to have nightmares tonight? <laughs> Yeah, and I think that um, that that gaming companies are um, <coughs> taking some of that stuff more seriously, but because um, of just the nature of that community, I think that they're always pushing the technological window in terms of what you can do in the virtual environment. And also, I, I it, it does not seem that they're particularly responsive to women's concerns um, in that context. And I think there's also a difference between what happens to, an, when we think about the, the repercussions and how we're going to wrestle with this, what happens with an avatar that you, that you don't have any sen sensory integration with, right? They just, you see your avatar on the screen get smacked by somebody versus having the haptic feedback and actually feeling a sensation. I think it's going to change over time. And what happens if when I was talking about, you know, the, 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 the sex toys and genital stimulation, what happens when you're, you're engaging in de genital stimulation with another person who's in another country or wherever, and their avatar, you think they're an adult, and it turns out they're 15 years old? What are we going to do about that? Do you have a question, Casey? I, I just can't get over the idea that, you know, the point in many of these games is to kill the other person's avatar. And so it seems so bizarre to me that we would have a problem Well, it's fine in the real world for us to kill each other, too. I mean, it, it's one of those things that I think we grapple with violence in very strange ways. Um, but we kind of have this special carve out for sex where we can't, you know, we treat it differently in, for so many reasons, you know? In and this country. In this country. And maybe it's just, uh, you know, some professor with a novel idea of how to get tenure. You know, I mean, maybe that's what it is. But. Um, but it's a different, for some reason, it seems like a completely different discussion than violence. It's just weird. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.